Well, dear ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, a very good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you're joining us from around the world for this special virtual event, the closing plenary of the Asia Pacific Transport Forum. My name is Sharon Jeet Lail, and it's a privilege to be your moderator for this plenary, where we will discuss the goal of sustainable transport by 2030. Now, we've had a very productive week of sessions since the opening plenary on Tuesday, and I hope you all have taken away valuable insights on how to not only achieve, but accelerate sustainable and decarbonized transport. Now, we have to do this in the face of the many transport challenges and opportunities in Asia against the context of COVID, the Sustainable Development Goals and climate change. Well, to welcome you all to the forum, I'd like to introduce the Chief of the Transport Sector Group at the Asian Development Bank, Jamie Leather, who's been instrumental in bringing these sessions about. He has had 30 years of experience in transport, working internationally with development organizations, governments, private sector, and research institutions. Jamie, over to you. Thank you very much, Sharon Jid. Uh, I will start the session by giving an overview of how ADB sees our sector work evolving up out to 2030. The document I will be covering is the Transport Sector Directional Guide. Uh, next slide, please. I will also give a little bit of the process which will lead to the focus areas where we believe that assistance will be provided across our client governments in Asia and the Pacific, as well as our work with the private sector. But we started this process by looking at what is the current status of transport in the region. What are the key performance indicators? What are the challenges? And perhaps more importantly, what are the opportunities? But also what are the demands that our clients are putting to us? What, what, what has ADB's transport sector assistance looked like and in which direction is it heading? Next slide, please. But we started off to remind ourselves what is a vision for sustainable transport. It is something that must be accessible, affordable, environmentally friendly, safe, and inclusive. We also must not forget that transport enables development by providing access to education, health, and economic opportunities. But as we're all too aware, there is a growing burden, and we've heard this over the last few days, of the externalities of the sector, be that congestion, emissions, both global and local, as well as the serious amount of road fatalities and serious injuries across the region. Next slide, please. So some of the key transport indicators, these, and what, what, how does Asia compare in some key areas of transport across compared to other regions in the world? What we do see, and I've just highlighted these in, in the blue box at the top there, these are the key findings. There is a significant infrastructure deficit. We see infrastructure in, in key areas, roads, rail, ports, airports, that's about half what it ought to be given the population or given the economic activity across the region. And because of this lack of infrastructure, there are also very low levels of access, rural access, urban access, regional connectivity between the countries and from the region to the rest of the world. And as a result of that, there is very high transportation costs, which impacts us all, the freight, as well as the passengers. A significant proportion of many people's disposable income is spent getting to and from school, spent to and from And we are actually right at the beginning of vehicle ownership. It's starting to take off and it will likely rise very rapidly. But despite that low level of vehicle ownership compared to other regions, Europe and, and North America, we do see a very high level of emissions. And many of the cities struggle from poor air quality. A lot of that is uh, due to transport emissions. Next slide, please. So what are some of the major challenges? I mentioned access. The Asian Transport Outlook, the database that ADB has put together, we estimate that 630 million people are without adequate rural access. And this is important because it is one of the defined sustainable development goals, 9.1 on rural access. A staggeringly high number, 1.3 or just under 1.4 billion people without good quality public transport in many of our cities, another SDG, this time 11.2. So access, if we refer to what transport does, it's enabler of development. But to be able to enable development, people have to have access and they have to be able to be mobile to, to get those opportunities. If we have such large numbers across the region, both in rural areas and in urban areas, 
we're not able to support those development goals that the transport sector could provide. There is also a significant infrastructure funding gap, and we're estimating that an additional 2.4% of GDP is required to fill in those missing infrastructure gaps across all of the transport sector. And linked to this is the need for coherent long-term policy um, uh, documentation to look at that with consistent implementation and going back to the financing, make sure there is money in place to provide the new infrastructure, upgrade the infrastructure, and increasingly to operate and maintain that infrastructure. In the short to medium term, we are seeing the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, and hopefully there won't be another pandemic, but they do seem to be coming with increasing regularity, so we may see another disruption. And clearly this has had a significant impact in the transport sector, um, be this in urban transport, there's been a shift away, in some cases good, to active modes of transport, in many cases not so good, people moving out of public transport and moving, purchasing motorbikes or even to private vehicles as well, adding to the congestion and the emissions in many of the cities. There's also been a significant knock-on impact in the logistics, and we're seeing that across the, the prices and the time to move goods around the world. And we will see a longer term change in travel behavior as a result of people working from home. Next slide, please. But when there's challenges, there's also opportunities. So while we're saying we are at this point in the Asia and the Pacific region, what can we do to make sure we see a better future? If we are saying that transport is in certain areas at its infancy, then we have the opportunity to develop and influence what that transport system might look like, how it operates, to make sure that we do provide a more inclusive and more sustainable future transport. I think one thing we're finding above all else is that we must deliver impacts at scale through a more programmatic approach. It's all very well looking at an individual piece of infrastructure, but is it really going to address the key drivers of, of broad access of road safety of transition to decarbonize the transport sector. So we need to look at ADB providing support to our clients in policy development, institutional capacity development, and integrating various forms for an efficient multimodal transport system. In terms of the transformation, the more innovative future for transport, we strongly believe that decarbonization will happen. And a little plug for Asia, about 97% of the global e-vehicles are within Asia and the Pacific region, heavily dominated by two-wheelers and three-wheelers. But if you take all vehicle types, Asia is leading the world in terms of e-mobility, and we should capitalize on that and make sure that we are seen as the region as we grow into increased vehicle ownership and vehicle use to ensure that we cover decarbonization in all areas of transport, public transport, private transport, long distance freight, in all modes as well, road transport, water transport, aviation. We should be looking at the decarbonization of all of those. We need to factor up considerably the digitalization, making much better use of data and information packages, both for the operators of transport systems, but for the end users as well. And we should look at mobilizing finance, particularly increased private sector finance. Transport isn't about just getting from A to B, it's also a significant employee. And we estimate 165 million people are employed in the transport sector across Asia and the Pacific. However, the very bottom note there, only 10% of this 165 million people are women. So there's significant gender imbalance in transport employment across the region, something we should be addressing. Next slide, please. In terms of ADB's sector assistance, what have our clients been seeking support from ADB in? We can see that over the last few decades, there has been almost a doubling in terms of lending volumes each decade. And we're currently looking at around four and a half billion dollars investment support in the transport sector. Um, and as you can see by the, then that makes it the largest sector in ADB at around 25% of total lending volume. You can also see by the colors in the pie chart, the blue is roads and it's, it's shrinking in terms of its share of overall sector support. And we are seeing a much more balanced portfolio with significant increases from our clients' demands for urban transport and rail transport. Next slide, please. So when we, that was setting the scene of where Asia and the Pacific is in terms of its transport, but we, we're more in 
concerned about what the future might look like. So we, we, we undertook an imagining of future, a foresight assessment, but we also looked at what are the driving forces for change as well. Next slide, please. The work uh, look at reimagining the future of transport across Asia and the Pacific. It was really rather than an incremental approach from basic and sort of extrapolation of current trends to look very much at put ourselves into that future and what we would like that future to look like, what the vision should be. And given those, what would we have to start doing to amend the way we are planning, delivering, implementing and operating our transport system. Some of the driving trends, population changes, behavioral changes, clearly the need to address climate emissions, disaster risk management, as well as a, a broader environmental risks, and ensure that we're up taking all the technological advances that are coming on as well. So from these trends, we set future visions for safe, reliable, inclusive, more gender sensitive transport systems, um, institutional technology and regional cooperation. So from the emerging trends, look at a preferred vision for those into the future, and then look at various uptakes of different growth scenarios, be a baseline, a more com progressive, or a very transformative one. So this foresight work was really used and will be used to say, what would we like our future to look like? How do we get there? Can we be very aggressive in terms of the changes we're making or will it be more slow in those trajectories? So it allows us to have differentiated approaches across our client governments and discuss with them what is relevant in their case and what pace of change we can aim for. And this would all lead to design of future ready transport investment pipelines that ADB can provide to our client governments, as well as support to the private sector. Next slide, please. I'm afraid this is rather a complicated slide, so let me try and just walk you through it. But these were the driving forces for change, both within the Asian Development Bank, but perhaps much more importantly from outside the Asian Development Bank. If we look at the bottom and, and we'll work our way up, some of those sector challenges and opportunities and what our client governments are seeking support in. We've mentioned population changes. There is an aging, um, aging population, but also an aging infrastructure. We're looking at the, the, the different components here within those, sec the, those sector challenges and opportunities that I outlined at the beginning. We've also seen a number of international agreements. There are the Sustainable Development Goals I mentioned earlier, but there's clearly the Paris Agreement and ADB, along with all the multilateral development banks, is committed to be aligned with the Paris Agreement. Uh, in our case, it will be the middle of next year where our support will be aligned with Paris Agreement. And more specifically within transport, we have the UN Decade of Action for Road Safety to halve the number of fatalities on our road. So those are the internal, also the broader transport drivers for change and the international agreement drive for change. And we sounded out through a number of academia, think tanks, government and uh, industry practitioners to see what, what their views are on how transport should evolve. And then within ADB to align our sector work with ADB strategy 2030, the corporate strategy, we looked at the seven operational priorities, as you can see at the, the, the next level. And this allowed us to really focus in on the type of assistance we think we should be providing and supporting across the region. And I will go into these in more detail, but just to cover it's it's looking at the infrastructure side, it's integrated transport systems, looking at the multimodal components, it's looking at improved accessibility. So it's not just about the infrastructure, it's about the transport usage and about the transport activities. So how do people get around? How do goods move around the transport network? And we also need to do this by reducing the negative externalities and having an impact at scale on SDGs and climate change and road safety, as well as the Aichi Declaration on Environmentally Sustainable Transport together with UNCRD. Next slide, please. So what would the future look like? What would we be hoping to promote in terms of our assistance in the transport sector to our clients across Asia and the Pacific. Next slide, please. It goes back to these, these driving forces of an integrated transport systems. Access still remains a basic need, but we do need differentiated approaches. Our, our, our member countries are at very different stages of development. Some of them are still seeking the basic infrastructure needs. Some of them are seeking highly complex infrastructure support as well. We need to modernize a lot of the existing infrastructure, 
and we certainly need to address the assets that are already in place and make sure that the operations and maintenance of those assets is upgraded to make sure that they are providing the benefits that they should be. We need to improve accessibility, certainly in terms of inclusiveness and affordability of those transport activities. And this would require policy development and support. In urban transport, we really must focus on a people-centric approach. How do people want to get around to make sure it's equitable for all, especially for women, and everyone feels safe using good quality public transport or non-motorized transport. On the freight side, we must look to reduce the transportation costs, and this can be done by ensuring different modes of transport serve as part of an integrated multimodal transport system that cross borders, cross regions, and does so very efficiently and effectively, and therefore reducing the transportation costs. In terms of finance, an increased role of private sector as investors, but also as operators and service providers. It's not just about private money, but it's about the expertise and the skills that the private sector can bring in transport system operations. And we must reduce the negative externalities. I won't go into details, but road safety is the leading cause of death of the, the, many of the youth and the, and the major earners in, in, the, in the heads of the household. Um, and 60% of fatalities in the world are within the Asia and the Pacific region. It's an area we must address. We know what to do largely through the safe system approach. We know what is successful, but in certain places, it's an Asian solution required. The number of motorbikes on the roads of Asia needs a particular Asian approach to road safety for two wheelers. We must strive to decarbonize the transport sector. And this would require policy, pushing of different vehicle types, drivetrains, e-vehicles, hydrogen, ammonia, and all of the technologies that will become available. And on the broader environmental side, we must look at nature-based approaches and look at disaster risk management to make sure when disasters hit, the transport system is responsive to those and it's disaster proof as much as it can be. I think to summarize, the, the, the the real push we will be looking for is outcome driven support and assistance to our clients. We will support institutional reform and transformational change. We'd look at transport system operations and allow for that impacted scale I mentioned. And I think this would be better delivered through results and policy based lending in addition to project infrastructure support. And we want to look at the transport role and monitor this in terms of international agreements. Next slide, please. The good news is that some of the projects we're already developing with our clients are demonstrating this. The Peshawar bus rapid transit project, which we spoke about earlier in the week, it is very much a people-centric urban transport project. An example of many of our, one of our many decarbonization transport projects here in the Kyrgyz Republic, looking at a number of e-buses in the transport, urban transport system. And mention of the Asia Pacific Road Safety Observatory that ADB together with other development partners are supporting governments across the region address road safety data, but utilizing that data, analyzing where the key problems are to have address those and have impacts on the ground to save lives. On asset management, a project here highlighting support in Mongolia for regional road development and a maintenance program. So it's institutional strengthening for that asset management. And pushing out into the, in, into the Pacific, Samoa, a green port study, improving climate resilience and safety and operations of a port, uh, Apia port in Samoa. Next slide, please. I hope that gave you an overview of where ADB sees the issues and the challenges and the opportunities in Asia and the Pacific in terms of transport over the next decade. And perhaps more importantly, where, it, where we see our role to support our clients across the region in achieve sustainable transport. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for that, Jamie, for those insights, many of which we will be discussing in our panel session next. And in fact, I'd like to introduce our expert panelists now and ask them to turn on their videos. Well, first up, we have Benedict uh, L.J. Ejbergen of the World Bank, who's uh, their practice manager for transport in East Africa. And of course, he's got a lot of experience indeed in the uh, transport sector, having worked in the sector for, for many decades now. And in fact, he played an instrumental part in India, uh, where he was uh, a coordinator there, transport, ICT, urban development, social development, energy and PPP programs. He's also worked in Russia and Ukraine. We know places that have been in the news a lot lately. 
And uh, next up, we have Lise uh, Briol, who heads the French Development Agency's Transport and Mobility Division, uh, which covers all modes of transport and engineer by training. She has a PhD related to the management of urban services in developing countries. We also have Mohamed Mezgani, who's the Secretary General of the International Association of Public Transport and has worked for more than 30 years in public transport, is a passionate advocate for urban mobility worldwide. Hideaki Iwasaki is the ADB's director for the Transport and Communications Division for Central and West Asia Department for the Asian Development Bank. And finally, Sujata Gupta is the director of the Sustainable Infrastructure Division of the East Asia Department at the Asian Development Bank and has been with the ADB for nearly 20 years. She was also a senior, uh, per, you know, she held very senior roles at the Tata Energy Research Institute and worked as a visiting researcher at the International Institute of Applied System Analysis. So uh, welcome to you all and thank you. And I'm looking forward to this discussion. Let's begin with an opening question. And I will ask the same question to you all. Now we've been talking about sustainability by which of course we mean decarbonize transport in line with the climate change goals that seek to decarbonize transport in a few short years. In this session's case, we say ambitiously that it can be done by 2030. But do you all believe this to actually happen uh, by then? It is a mere eight years away. And if not, what are some of the main challenges standing in the way? Well, Iwasaki-san, let's start with you. Uh, what are the challenges you see? And tell us about the ADB's approach uh, to value-added assistance that may help address it. And thank you, uh, Saranjit, and uh, I'm very happy to be back here. Um, this is a very tough question. And um, uh, that's because although uh, in my region, we have some prominent projects like the Peshawar BRT and the Kyrgyz uh, public transport electrification projects, uh, these are good projects and we want to replicate these projects elsewhere, but we know that there's a limit. Uh, success of these projects, they depend on the availability of the government's and counterparts' willingness to adopt these projects. And as also the socioeconomic setting these locations have. So we can simply you know, apply the same model to other uh, localities. And also in uh, many of the development member countries, they still have to rely on roads for basic access, as has been uh, ably presented by Jamie. And how we decarbonize roads is a major, major question we'll have to deal with. Um, but I feel uh, we have an opportunity here, actually, because we work in many developing member countries in this area. So we can initiate policy dialogue utilizing our strong links with road agencies and the transport ministries and get them seriously think about the way to decarbonize the, the vehicle fleet and also strengthen uh, railways or other uh, greener modes of transport. So um, I can't really give you an answer or yes or no, but I feel we have a lot of opportunities to engage with our counterparts to get their major policy change. Without that, we won't be able to achieve this 2030 goal. Now let me pause here. Well, you're absolutely right, Iwasaki-san. It is a very tough question indeed. Uh, Lisa Abriel, uh, let's move on to you now. What do you think are, are the main challenges to hitting that goal? And how can development partners collaborate to mitigate these? Thanks. Thanks, Charanjit, for giving me uh, the floor. Well, compared to you, ADB, or to the World Bank, the French Development Agency is a small player in Asia. A small player, but with uh, strong convictions and, and a clear mandate on climate. And this is why our focus in the region has been since the very beginning on urban mobility and railway development, two subsectors that combine both impacts on improved accessibility 
and a high potential for reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So coming back to your question, Sharanjit, I'll focus on the main challenges that I see for urban mobility and what we can do as development banks to address them. And the challenge is not less than keeping our cities livable, breathable, efficient and inclusive. Um, and this is to develop another pattern of mobility that is not centered on individual chemic car, but, and I insist on this, neither on uh, individual electric car or neither on electric two wheelers, but rather on a mix of attractive public transport and non-motorized modes. And that implies taking measures at all levels, not only in the field of transport. So what should we do? As development bank, we should ob obviously redirect our fundings on those investments that are aligned, 100% aligned with decarbonization of the sector. And let me, let me give you how we see that at AFD. AFD is co-financing um, essentially uh, mass transit public transport in big cities in Asia, whether this is metro, like in many, many Indian cities or in Turkey or in Vietnam, or whether this is BRT together with ADB in Pakistan, Jamie has mentioned Peshawar, or, or Dhaka, or, or in Bangladesh, or Cebu in Philippines. And these infrastructure are key for the sustainable development of the cities, yes. But what I want to convey as a message, and Jamie mentioned this in his introduction, is that we should go beyond the infrastructure approach and we should push policies to develop a more systemic approach of urban mobility. I want to just mention five points that are super important for me uh, regarding this. First, um, support sustainable urban mobility planning, which means with low carbon objective, ambitious low carbon objective, with participative approach to include all stakeholders, local and national, public and private, and most important, with realistic financial strategies uh, with a prioritization of investment. Um, and this, I think there was a session dedicated uh, to SEMP last week during the pre-event, um, building on, on the methodologies that we developed together with the global partnership Mobilize Your City. Second point, developing intermodality with integration of paratransit, improved accessibility, and I mean physical integration and tariff integration. Third point, being inclusive for the most vulnerable women or the poorest who live in the outskirts of the cities. Fourth, develop, and this, I don't have the answer for this, develop a specific approach for the motorized two-wheelers that have become dominant in many Asian cities. And I suppose it's something quite difficult to tackle. And last but not least, create the enabling governance system that will be able to have this integrated vision of mobility and, and make it happen. And while saying this, I know that this seems to be sort of uh, obvious or well-known, because these are all the good works who could be against integration or inclusiveness. But what I want to say is that this is really a difficult job in the field. And I see that every day because very often we have different entities in charge of buses and metros at different levels. And in some places, no one with a clear mandate for this integrated vision. And this is very much needed if we want this big and costly infrastructure that we do finance as development partners to deliver impacts for all and for the planet. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lisa. And as you say, it, it is a tough one, isn't it? There's, there's just so many requirements to hitting those targets. Now, Mohamed Mezgani, on to you next. You believe in the role of urban transport and mobility in cities. So are these uh, solutions to some of the challenges that we've been discussing? Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's, uh, I mean, urban transport is, is, is a very important uh, element and component of uh, the sustainability uh, approach, I would say. But I would like to, to come back to what you said, uh, uh, Sharanjit. Uh, you said in your introduction, uh, sustainability means decarbonization. And I don't agree. Sustainability has three dimensions. Sustainability has the social dimension, the economic dimension, and then the environmental dimension. And this is the challenge we have now, is that we are focusing on the environmental dimension and we are not uh, in having an integrated approach to sustainability. I have been 
uh, watching also and listening to the keynote speaker and one of the slides uh, with, was talking about decarbonization of transport. And the example that was mentioned there was about the decarbonization of public transport. When we speak about decarbonization of transport, we have to cover our all modes and we have to consider the three dimensions, avoid, shift and improve. And we, we, we should not focus on improve only. So I think we one of the challenge is really to have this integrated approach. It was mentioned by Liz, uh, also uh, some perspective she, she, she has shared. And, and so this is, this is uh, important. And if we consider the three dimensions, uh, if we talk about the economic dimensions, uh, dimension. You know, when we invest one euro in developing public transport, it creates four euros in the local economy. Uh, also, for the same amount of money invested in public transport, we create 25% more jobs than in road construction. And when we speak about jobs, generally speaking, public transport is amongst the largest employers. In some cities, you know, I don't have examples in Asia, unfortunately, but in some cities like Brussels or Amsterdam, it's even the largest employer in the city. So, and these are local jobs that cannot be relocated and their number is continuously growing all over the world. So this economic dimension, we should not, uh, we should not uh, miss it. And then the environmental dimension, of course, it's a very important one, it's a key one. And of course, transport represents 25 to 30% of the CO2 emissions uh, and the large part of the air pollution. Uh, but 95% of those emissions are related to road transport. Rain represents only 1%. And, and in those road transport emissions, 50% are related to cars. Uh, so it clearly shows the problem, where the problem is. And 70% of those CO2 emissions take place in urban areas. So here, the importance of, of, of working and acting in cities. And, and public transport is four times less energy and less CO2, uh, um, emitting less CO2 than cars. So, and despite all these important figures and challenges, only 35% of the countries have included public transport in their national climate plans that were discussed in, uh, uh, in, in, in the COP uh, uh, recently. So you see that we are, we, we are missing very important dimensions uh, in, the, in the chance. And then the third one, and I will stop with that, is the social dimension, of course. Public transport offers mobility for all by, by definition. Uh, in terms of road safety, there is scientific evidence showing that when there is more public transport, we have less traffic fatalities. And, and also public transport users, you know, uh, they walk more, uh, they, 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 they are less exposed to uh, cardiovascular diseases, to obesity, etc. So we see here what is at stake. And, and now the recent events, uh, the, the, the climate emergency, of course, with the IPCC report just published, the COVID pandemic and the essential role of, of public transport during that COVID pandemic, uh, and, and now the war in Ukraine and its impact on energy supply or energy prices. So it is showing us that we really need to act uh, uh, urgently and we don't have any other choice than ending the domination of cars in our cities and giving back the urban space to people. I mean, we, we must move people and not cars by prioritizing walking, cycling and, and public transport. And thank you. Absolutely, Mohammed, you said it. It is absolute urgent action uh, that is required. And you are absolutely right. Sustainability is not just about decarbonization. It is much more than that. And I hope we'll get a chance to talk more about it as well. Uh, we can move on to, uh, to Benedict uh, Eshbrosian now. Uh, give us a development partner perspective, specifically the World Bank perspective on how transport programs around the world are, are, are transforming uh, due to the recent climate change agreements. And, and will this be enough to actually hit that elusive target of 2030? Yeah, thank you. Thank you all uh, for the introductions for, uh, for, the, for the points, because it uh, gives a kind of overview of all the issues, Jamie, which is pretty, pretty nicely the whole context of transport and the importance of transport. Moment is quite right in, in terms of the overt shift and reproof kind of policies. But we're all into that. So let's not talk too quickly about is it the time frame too, too short to accomplish all of this? Because I think we should already recognize what, what is going on, the shift after the Paris Agreement, what a fundamental shift that is, and the race to net zero, uh, the decarbonization agenda that is 
now developed in a relatively very short period of time and, and the commitment for that. But in transport, we need to reflect a little bit how we position it, have positioned ourselves. And I was a bit jealous to our, uh, regarding our energy colleagues because, uh, because transport is rather complex. I'm not saying energy is simple, but it is to some extent rather straightforward. So I'm always a bit provocative to our uh, World Bank energy colleagues in that, that respect. Because we, we have a rather challenging job ahead. Because low carbon transition of transport sector is very complex. And that complexity is not fully appreciated from our clients and sometimes even with our own professional community. So let, let's the energy transition, for instance. Phasing out coal has been in the front and center when it comes to the notion of low, low carbon transition. And it attracts most of the political financial support as well as public debate. And that's transport, we're not there yet. So, and the big elephant in the room for transport is, of course, the phasing out of the fossil fuel based vehicle use for passengers and, and freight. And it's receiving less attention, less of the spotlight, despite being one of the most uh, structural challenges uh, compared to, to uh, energy. Actually, it's more challenging. And like the use of the issue of phasing out coal, which is primarily a supply side issue. Phasing out fossil fuel based vehicle use also require a profound change in demand, demand management, and change in individual choices, changes in behavior, also percep perception. So this, this increasingly popular idea of notion that electrification, electrification of vehicles will solve all our problems for the transport sector, this, this has to be corrected for a few, uh, few reasons. Because first of all, if, if not cautiously coordinated with the pace of energy transition and electric vehicle technology, technological progression, system-wide electrification of transport could easily make countries spending much more than needed with very limited saving on the life cycle of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And second, even if, if we all um, get all our vehicles on the road today electrified, cities like indeed uh, Hanoi, Jakarta, Manila, will still suffer from incredible congestions and road safety risks. So I'm saying again, there's no silver bullet. So decarbonization transport sector will require all of us to help our clients to carefully design and implement holistic policies and investment interventions on the basis need again, on the avoid shift and improve principles. And each of them needs to reshape both the supply side and demand side of transport infrastructure and services. So what does it mean? Let me be more specific here. And, and, and also address Lisa's point on the, the, the bikes. Uh, it means moving 90% of the passengers across South Asia and Southeast Asia from motorbikes to high quality public mass transit options. And turning motorbikes from a dominant mobility mode to a supporting mode for first and last mile connectivity to public transport. I know it's difficult, but we need to do this. It means helping emerging cities in the region to establish themselves as a compact, transit-oriented, and walking, less biking-friendly cities, cities, rather than following the old traditional car-centric urban development patterns, patterns as the capital cities did. It means also aggressively investing in low-carbon modes for freight transport to make railways and waterways, uh, coastal shipping, truly competitive to road-based trucking. It takes not only infrastructure development, but also strong investment in cargo consolidation, service modernization, logistics, and private sector development. It also means that doing more of what we have been doing less in the past, engaging on policy dialogues with our clients on fuel economy, emission standards for vehicles, and promoting clean fuels, obviously. So, so my message actually is a bit that we as a community, transport community, we need to do a better job in claiming that rightful level of priority for decarbonization of the transport sector. And most importantly, support our counterparts, Ministry of Transport, for instance, to establish that strong value proposition in the government in the wake of this race to zero emissions. And this is my main message. Let's help them. Thank you. Thank you for those messages. Those messages are very powerful messages indeed, Benedict. And as you say, there's so much complexity 
in this argument of whether we can decarbonize and because transportation has so many issues, electrification may not necessarily be the answer, as you say, for many, many cities in this region. Uh, we can move on to Sujata Gupta now. Uh, Sujata, what challenges do you think may stand in the way of hitting that elusive goal of 2030? And give us examples of innovative projects that can perhaps be scaled up to work that may help us uh, achieve a sustainable transport future. Thank you, uh, Sharanji. Uh, I guess being the last speaker on the panel, I have the advantage of the wisdom of the earlier panelists. But um, by and large, I would agree with uh, what has been said thus far. However, I'm more optimistic. And I think uh, we can tackle the problem, maybe not by 2030, but definitely in the slightly longer term. Uh, what, what's important in my mind is that transport systems can no longer be looked at in isolation. I can't say it's easier in the energy sector or more difficult in the transport sector because transport or all sectors in today's world are integrated. So transportation has to be looked at in an integrated manner, looking at integration with other sectors, integration with different modes of transportation. It has to be inclusive. That is, it's accessible and affordable for all. And it has to be benign, both in terms of safety and environmental impact. And today we can do this more effectively and efficiently with smart technologies. So having said that, let me um, give you a couple of examples of what um, ADB has been doing in the PRC or the People's Republic of China. Uh, they have met their basic transportation needs, but not in a sustainable manner as they have suffering from air pollution and congestion. So we worked at a city level in the Shantan Low Carbon City Development Project, which was to transform the transport system from being car-centered to people-centered, enhancing safety, inclusiveness, and resilience to climate change and other uh, climate or other catastrophic events. So it included a number of uh, interventions like peak car curbside bus priority lanes, upgrading bus stops, and uh, improved walking and cycling facilities for seamless access across different modes. And uh, also uh, the municipality will modify the access and layout of two railway stations using a user-friendly and inclusive design to facilitate transition between public low carbon mobility modes. So the idea is behind all of our interventions is to make low carbon transport more attractive and safe. So in the same program, uh, we have a school zone transformation at five primary schools that will raise road safety awareness and will exceed the requirements of the highest safety rating for walking and cycling under the International Road Asset Program or the IRAP star rating for schools. In addition, these interventions are coupled with policy actions that include enhancing low carbon mobility. So we have to take a holistic view of the entire problem. Uh, Looking at uh, you know, uh, the transport sector, I would like to talk about the transport ladder. And I think um, uh, this was referred to earlier also in a different way. We, and it's a term I borrow from the energy sector. There's the energy ladder. So as incomes increase, the modes of transportation change. So from cycling or public transport, uh, users move to motorized two wheelers, to small cars, to bigger and safer cars. And what is required is to make public transport more enticing for all, and something that leads to an improvement in the quality of life. Another example we have in uh, Buhishou, Buyan, uh, where we 
developed intelligent transport systems, but the focus was using human-centered design principle in developing the public facilities. So in this, the users <clears throat> were consulted extensively. Their requirements were analyzed and incorporated in the design of the facilities. Also important, very important, behavior change communication campaigns were included to encourage the use of public transport. So there is a social block also in terms of moving on to public transport. Uh, another project has green roads. Uh, we are just going to take it to board this year. It's the Helen John. And this incorporates a collection of best practices um, for sustainability that relate to, again, roadway design and construction, increasing the use of bicycles and the ease of walking, which are the most affordable and practical ways to reduce uh, CO2 emissions and to boost access to economic opportunity for the poor. So again, this project will conduct a road safety audit under the IRAP road safety assessment of the detailed design of the project to ensure that traffic and other road safety interventions are incorporated in the design to achieve a minimum three-star rating for pedestrian and to ensure that other road users that have a one star rating are eliminated. Those areas are upgraded or uh, improved so that they have a better star rating. Now, without ADP's participation in all these interventions, you know, because I speak about the PRC, which is a developed developing country, but without ADP's participation in these interventions would not have incorporated or would have been incorporated in a very limited way. So this gives us as development uh, oriented bank satisfaction that we are adding value with our uh, interventions. Thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you for that Sujata and great to hear about those projects in uh, PRC and elsewhere that the ADB is working on and also those, those studies uh, into uh, behavior are crucial as well, how to get people to cycle and walk again. So thank you once again, uh, panelists, for those great insights. Uh, next, we can proceed to round two. And this is where we want to hear about solutions. So this is the chance to talk about uh, some of the concrete examples that have worked and what hasn't worked. So iwasaki san let's start with you again. Uh, tell us about the need for access and connectivity and how ADB is prioritizing projects and positioning itself to add value in its assistance to various countries' transport programs. Great, uh, thank you, Sharanji. Um, this is again, you know, not, uh, not an easy question to answer. Uh, and uh, I, I will also focus on road sector because many other panelists, they talked about urban transport and mobility. Um, uh, in the uh, road sector and in the countries I cover in Central and West Asia region, uh, population density is very low. So you'll have to prioritize which roads to upgrade. Uh, practically, um, the uh, road, roads are the main uh, links to many of the people living in rural areas. Railways do exist, but um, their, their uh, scope of service is quite limited. Uh, civil aviation, again, because of low population density and demand density, uh, it doesn't work very well. So you have to focus on roads. Uh, so far, ADB has focused on uh, improving higher category roads which are uh, connecting different countries. Uh, so these are called uh, sub-regional connectivity roads. Uh, we have the regional grouping of CARIC, uh, Central Asia Regional Economic uh, Cooperation. Uh, under this banner, uh, we have been providing uh, financial support as well as technical assistance to upgrade these higher category roads. 
Um, uh, and uh, we are probably coming to uh, uh, not really an end, but probably uh, a completion of the initial round of intervention to upgrade these uh, Karek uh, road corridors. And the next challenge we are facing is actually to upgrade the second tier roads, the secondary provincial roads or rural roads. Um, on this, actually elsewhere in, a, uh, in ADB uh, regions, we have some successful examples uh, like in India or Bangladesh and uh, also some countries in Southeast Asia. So we would be replicating those rural roads program to upgrade connectivity to villages and smaller towns. Uh, we haven't really started any major programs in the Central and West Asia region, but that's something uh, on the table for us to work on. Let's stop there. Yeah, there's so much to work on, isn't there? Thank you for that, Iwasaki-san. Now, uh, Lisa, Ria, let's uh, move on to you now. Let's give us uh, some examples of AFD's future transport solutions. You know, what are some of the, the examples of support uh, that the AFD provides a, a lot of these transport programs? Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I can just give you an example of the approach that I, I was mentioning in my first intervention, which is going beyond infrastructure to make it deliver impact. I can talk about Hanoi Metro because we do that, we do finance that together and it's a difficult project, a very challenging project for mo now more than 10 years. Hopefully we will have a first section being implemented at the end of this year or next year. But what I want to say is this is just the beginning of the challenge, not the end. Because if we want this metro just to reach the expected ridership and hence the impact, we need to build everything around the metro, feeder lines, integrated ticketing, accessibility uh, by walking and cycling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, that's what we are preparing for a future project together uh, with uh, Hanai. And, and that's exactly the kind of, of uh, pathway we try to develop with our partners. In addition to that, and I can provide with a lot of examples just like this, where we start with this infrastructure and we do more after that. I just wanted to emphasize three other topics that I think we, we should, we would like to develop further. Uh, the first one is the modernization of paratransit. This is a key sector, Jimmy has mentioned it, and Mohammed also, uh, whether you call it jeepneys or encore tuk-tuk, I mean, this is an industry that provides very often the majority of the mobility supply in, in the big cities at no cost for the public authorities, and it also provides thousands of jobs. And there is a big challenge to modernize the system from inside and provide an improved service for the user, more reliable, more comfortable, less negative externality, less, less pollution, less emissions, and more road safety. And the challenge is to do that without jeopardizing too much the financial balance of the sector, challenging but crucial, for instance, through uh, subsidized credit lines to renew the fleets or through a better regulation to limit the number of vehicle, et cetera. So this is something where I think we should all uh, development partners, think tanks, put a lot of efforts. And uh, by the way, we have we are developing a number of documents with the partnership Mobilize Your City on, on that topics about modernization of paratransit. Second topics that I think is also should be developed in the future is secondary cities. So far, I think we've all been engaged in big cities, whether this is Peshawar, Hanoi, Bangalore, Bandung, I mean, these are multimillionaire cities. But urbanization is also taking place at a rapid pace in what we call secondary cities, where you, you don't need necessarily the big metro, but still you need to do something so that people will not go into individual car. Uh, you need small investment for bus station, traffic calming, pedestrian safety, etc. And I would say that I, I believe there is a lack of political willingness or awareness, I don't know, to invest in these cities. So, my message is also that we need to raise awareness regarding this. And third topic that I would like to mention that has been mentioned by some of our panelists as well, last but not least, uh, it is air quality. AFD has been committed to quite a lot of money on air quality very recently at the regional level in partnership with ASEAN. 
And so far, it's only technical assistance to support ministries, cities for, in order to measure, understand, monitor, and raise awareness. And this is a public health issue, and this is closely uh, interconnected with climate. Um, and we hope that this will help developing policies and investment across sectors, transport, of course, but also waste managing, management or energy, et cetera. And I think it's a topic that is transversal that we shouldn't forget, forget in Asia. So important uh, topic to invest in terms of analytical works and uh, future development laws. So this is uh, some prospect that I'm happy to, to do more with you um, development partners and, and you are beneficiaries. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, Lise, thank you so much. And so good to hear about those projects in Hanoi and elsewhere. Now, Mohamed uh, Mezgani, we can move on to you. Tell us about the future urban access and mobility solutions that you foresee. Thank you, thank you. It's always hard to speak about the future uh, because we have already very important uh, problems to solve now in the in the present time. But uh, based on the challenge I I mentioned earlier, I think it's obvious that the the future urban mobility is a mobility putting people at, at the heart. Uh, a mobility uh, without without cars as much as as possible, or at least. Uh, with much less individual use of cars. Uh, I, I refer to what uh, Benedict said earlier, and I, I want, I mean, he explained very well that uh, a green traffic jam is still a traffic jam, or a clean traffic jam is still a traffic jam. So, I mean, turning the, the existing cars, cars or replacing the exist, existing cars by uh, uh, zero emission cars will not solve the, the problem. So, uh, we need to put people at the heart, means looking to mobility from their perspective. And this is the challenge of our policymakers. Uh, it means that they have to put themselves in the shoes of, 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 of people, of their citizens. Uh, it also making sure that the, the decisions are taken for the benefit of their citizens and their, and their cities. And this is possible. Uh, we, have learned from, uh, we have learned many lessons from the, uh, the pandemic about the importance of uh, designing a resilient public transport system. Uh, about the key role of digitalization and its acceleration during the, the pandemic, and also the rapid development of on-demand and shared mobility solutions, uh, including paratransit. And this was mentioned uh, just now by, uh, by Liz. So we must leverage on the benefit of each of, uh, of those modes by finding the, the right combination of urban mobility solutions as an alternative to cars. So it means that public transport or mass public transport, I would like to say, uh, or the conventional, let's say, public transport, the conventional meaning of public transport, this mass public transport is and will remain the backbone in our cities. But mass public transport alone can, cannot answer all mobility demands. So with the growing digitalization, we have the opportunity to combine it with on-demand and shared mobility solutions uh, in a way that will help citizens build door-to-door uh, journeys and not just station to station. Mass public transport is about moving station to station. And now we need to find solutions where they can that we can plan door to door uh, door to door trips. Uh, and and this will offer citizens the tailor made solutions because they can use the mode they want or the solution they want according to the purpose of their trip, the place where they are, the, the time of the day, the tariff they can afford, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So really about uh, this is what I mean by uh, putting ourselves in their shoes. And it's about leveraging on the, on the diversity of mobility options that are available, regardless whether they are operated by private or public operators, by local or global companies. Because, uh, you know, the, the people using this mode, they don't care who is operating, as long as uh, it answers their expectations. They don't care if it's a bus of a ride-hailing service, as long as the service is punctual, is reliable. This is what they expect. They, they don't want to know who, who is operating. And so this is a fundamental redefinition of public transport, which will include all collective, shared and on-demand modes, including paratransit, of course, uh, everything which is not the individual use of cars. And, and this will have implication on, on, on the governance, of course, on the role of authorities, on the funding schemes. Uh, and, and I would like to say this opportunity to mention that we have recently published at UITP what we call a better urban mobility playbook with many examples on how this can be, uh, can be deployed in, in, in our cities. And then, of course, digitalization will offer the opportunity to develop the right tools to make this uh, possible and 
and one of them being mass mobility as a service, which is already you know developed in in in, in some cities, which is uh, uh, which will make convenient to combine all modes in one in one app. And maybe since we are talking about the future, one day we will have uh, automated vehicles that will be part of the system, with the condition that they are deployed as shared vehicles, complementing mass transport and not as driverless cars owned individually and used individually. So this is how I see the future, I would say, of urban, of urban mobility. And this is the, the only way to address the climate challenge while improving safety, accessibility, health, and keeping our cities prosperous and, and ensuring the well-being of, uh, of people. Thank you. Yeah. Those are so crucial, aren't they? And I would love to hear more about uh, some of the solutions in that playbook you mentioned as well. Now, Benedict, let's move on to you. Uh, give us examples of how the World Bank is shaping its transport programs to support its member countries uh, to achieve those crucial Paris objectives. Yeah, so thank you. Um, and I cannot take the full credit because we're working with our partners and one of them is here, AB of course, but also uh, Lisa is here. So we're co-financing a lot, lot of our projects. So lots of uh, kudos for, for our partners here. So not doing it alone. But but um, again, the, 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 we're making our, and that's that's our commitment now, all our projects now, uh, Paris, it's a new word, Paris aligned. So Lisa should be very happy about that word. That will be a phrase uh, that will come back over and over again. We will be Paris aligned. And that is meant to make sure that we are following the commitments to uh, net zero. And for, for decarbonization of the transport sector, we're developing a private pipeline, again, around to avoid shift improvement principles. So that's not just the decarbonization. It's also climate resilience, adaptation. Climate resilience is also very uh, much part of our uh, equation. So we're doing a lot on the trying to do a lot on the decarbonization, but also on the climate resilience. And we'll give you a few examples of that. And I'm very happy to, uh, to report that today we uh, finalized completed the negotiations for a very important project in Indonesia. And these are very happy to hear that too. Uh, the mass trans, the Indonesia mass transit project, which is an example of this kind of financing. Uh, together with the AMD, this, this pipeline project, this new project follows a three-year World Bank TA, technical assistance, assistance that led to the establishment of a national program, an Indonesia National Mass Transit Program. And um, this mass tram will finance the first phase of the national program, supports development of BOT corridors in Bandung and Medan, and will also feed into a follow-up hopefully light rail transit line in the next phase. So this BRT and LRT system, for instance in Indonesia, once completed, will form the cornerstone for shifting passenger mobility from Angkot, the informal sector, in the, as mentioned, uh, uh, the fragmented minibuses to high quality mass uh, transit. This, this is an example of that approach we are following, not just project by project, but translating it into programs. Um, so that this, this scaling up of public transport is taking place in many other countries as well. For instance, in Beijing, we're working on two new projects to support uh, policy framework and city cluster to bring results-based financing for comprehensive decarbonization efforts in, in China. In Vietnam, we're doing the same for Hanoi Metro, Hanoi Metro Line 6, and that's also with support of other partners as well in Hanoi. Um, on the freight side, uh, we're working in Vietnam quite a bit. Uh, we're in the, in the final stage of uh, preparing Southern Waterway Logistics Corridor project, an uh, upgrading of 300 kilometers of waterway corridors in Vietnam's very important uh, booming Mekong Delta. It will enable a portion of freight that is currently transported by trucks on the overloaded National Highway 51. But that's a clear e example. Uh, that will lead to a net GSG greenhouse gas emission reduction of 4.3 million ton CO2. Um, so this, will, this project is expected to be a strong uh, contribution to, uh, to help Vietnam move towards its new, just announced, uh, Glasgow announced net, net zero target by 2050. Um, in East 
Indonesia were also developing a waterborne transport fields project uh, linking uh, integrate maritime connectivity, green port, clean fuels, fishery development, also cold chain logistics in the same kind of manner, improving the logistics, lowering transport costs, uh, decarbonize, uh, and, and so on. And a great example perhaps to roll out to other places like the uh, Philippines. And on the climate resilience side, we're helping a lot of countries getting, getting their framework right and also improving, uh, improving the climate resilience within the, the infrastructure. A uh, special case is our engagement in the Pacific, uh, where we have a large uh, engagement all around climate resilience, connect connectivity on roads, air, and maritime projects. Mm. And then the last group cluster of projects, and, and there's very important to, and I missed that a little bit in the presentation so far, is regional connectivity. We're going to the board uh, soon with our Southeast Asia Regional Economic Corridor and Connectivity Project. It's in the north part of Laos, connecting Thailand, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. And we would like to have a spillover into Vietnam as well in, in the northern part of Vietnam connecting that, that part with Laos. This could lead not only to, uh, of course, trade facilitation and, and movement of goods, but of course, movement of goods that is more efficient, lowering transport costs, and also helping with the decarbonization of, of the sector. So these are some of the examples. Um, we are doing also a lot of sector work, what we call analytical work, studies, helping uh, countries in, in setting the right frameworks. As I said earlier on, there's a lot to be done in terms of policy reforms. And we're trying to help our governments, the governments in setting kind of environment in place for the right policies. Um, that is greener, resilient, and, and safer in terms of uh, yeah, the transport. Thank you, back to you. Yeah, well said, uh, Benedict, and some great examples of uh, projects you've worked on. Of course, it's not just uh, the World Bank, but it's in concert with many, many MDBs like the ADB and others. So really crucial to hear about how these projects are really making a difference. And the regional connectivity is, as you said, something that we should be focusing on as well. Now, Sujata, let's move on to you because, uh, you know, we heard about the project the ADB worked on in uh, PRC, but give us, you know, examples of others perhaps that have, you know, integrated transport systems and vastly uh, improved operational efficiencies. I mean, can these projects be scaled up and be applied anywhere or are they very specific to the areas that they uh, target? Thank you, Sharanjit. Yeah, I think, uh... <laughs> I started speaking about solutions in round one, whereas I was supposed to focus only on uh, the problems. But again, all our projects um, are, are supposed to have a demonstration impact. And very often you would see in the titles of our project, it's a demonstration or a replication project. And we emphasize transfer, knowledge transfer very much. So um, in terms of looking at, uh, and then I see a comment in the um, question and answers that we've been focusing only on uh, mobility of people and not looking at freight. So let me focus on an example which reflects the system's uh, operational efficiency and integration in, in the freight sector. And we have recently um, completed a project which was uh, 200 million US dollars. Uh, again, in my region, it was in the PRC, which is the Sangshi Green Intelligent Transport and Logistic Management Demonstration Project. And the main objective was of the project is to support Sangshi province in developing and demonstrating climate resilient and green intelligent transport, logistic and supply chain ecosystem to foster low carbon growth. So the project included components such as establishing a logistic facility. I 
actually seven logistic facilities that are built according to green building norms, um, incorporating sponge city techniques, such as um, 30, earmarking 35% of the area for green spaces, use of uh, porous concrete for platforms and pathways, rainwater harvesting systems, and use of renewable energy. So here, you know, again, what I've said earlier, the integration is happening. This doesn't really sound to you like a transport project, does it? Further, these facilities were designed to incorporate innovative uh, digital platforms, such as automated material handling capabilities. So these helped to reduce accidents in material handling and increase the efficiency of goods management. It also includes integrated digital inventory management systems for the seven facilities. And they share product details and optimize route planning of goods from the facility. So this significantly contributes to lowering traffic congestion and lowering traffic congestion leads to re reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, the project also develops an integrated e-commerce platform that enables efficient trade and uh, maximization of revenue for the users. And these users would be mostly farmers and traders that uh, rely on these facilities. And then what's also important is the location, the strategic location of these facilities with uh, dedicated built-in access for multimodal transportation. So uh, there's an integration of the roads and rails to facilitate um, freight movement from one to the other. And also the facilities are um, near in the vicinity of airports. So there's an integration of different modes of transportation. So I will stop with this one example here. Thank you. And there's some great examples indeed, and so many out there. Now, at this point, uh, thank you, audience. You've all been sending through some great questions, and I'd like to go to some of the many questions that are being posed on the chat. So let's take a look. There's a, a really nice one from uh, George Florence Steik, who thank you for your question. And you ask, what is or should be the role of public-private partnership, and especially uh, the role and contribution of private commercial banks, uh, private equity investment funds in the financing of transport decarbonizing uh, sustainable green-blue projects? So, so this is crucial. Is this something that uh, any of you would like to talk about first? No, but, uh, well, maybe I'll call on Benedict. What, what is the World Bank experience when it comes to public-private partnerships? Because it certainly is something that is needed because the expense and the complexities, as you mentioned, is immense in trying to uh, solve these problems. Yeah, obviously. So it's, uh, we, we focus a lot on the public sector, but of course the implementation has to be done by the private sector. So for instance, if we do all those uh, new new uh, urban transport kind of uh, engagements, operations with uh, BRT or Metro uh, or, or uh, informal sector kind of engagements it has to be done effectively uh, by the private sector. So not just only the operations, but also the financing will have to come from, from that part. Uh, the public sector can only do as much as they can do, but the private sector can, can chip in and if, if the right framework is there for them to be successful in operations, then they can play a very important part and the enabling environment needs to be there as well. So that's on the public and the, on the mass transit, uh, on the passenger side of things. On the freight side of things, there's so much to be done in terms of making transport more efficient. Uh, and there, there is a lot to be gained. Uh, we were talking about dry ports, uh, involvement of the private sector in in the provision of, of services, uh, logistics. Uh, and I think we haven't explored that enough in our region. Uh, there's a lot to be improved there as, as well. So our, our projects, 
they, they have a very strong kind of uh, private sector involvement as well. And we try to even carve out a private cap a capital mobilization kind of uh, amount, PCM uh, amount, as it's being called in, in the bank. So we are forced or encouraged <laughs> to, to create a private sector component and financing through our project to not only enable private sector involvement, but also find private sector financing through our project. So a, a kind of trigger, kind of catalyst for private sector financing. And that's not that easy. Uh, sometimes, yeah, we think it's easier to go through a public sector kind of uh, engagement, but it forces us to think about bringing them on board, creating opportunities. And, and, and that can be done but it forces us to think outside of the box and to bring in that kind of uh, involvement. Back to you. Great. Thank you for that, Benedict. And, and actually, there's a question here as well from uh, Lucy Tania from the government of uh, Timor-Leste. Thank you for your question. This is one for Mr. Uh, Me Mezgani. Uh, could you elaborate more on urban transport? How do we prioritize between the three dimensions of transport solution for our government to take up the challenge on which one to address first, the economic or the environment or the social dimension challenges? Uh, very interesting question. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Gary, would you like to try to answer that? Yeah, thank, uh, thank you. Indeed, it's an important uh, question and uh, it gives me the opportunity to say we should not prioritize one over the others. This we should aim to achieve the three dimensions in parallel at the same time and make sure that each one fits the other. Uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, in the, in the keynote speaker presentation, uh, he mentioned the example of the uh, BRT in Peshawar. Let's take that example. For this BRT of, of, of Peshawar, I am sure the, the benefits are at the three, uh, the three levels. There are benefits in terms of uh, social benefits because it will improve the social inclusion. It will offer mobility for all, also those who have, cannot afford the car. Uh, it will improve road safety uh, of having this BRT. Then at the economic level, it will uh, provide access to more jobs and make you know, easier people to, 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 to get access to those jobs. Uh, uh, it will uh, it will also create jobs during the construction, the operation of the of the system. Uh, uh, also, uh, since it's a BRT, people will uh, sp spend less time in congestion, and you know the time saved is is for the economic. Uh, it has an economic uh, impact, of course, uh, and 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 then and from the environmental uh, perspective, oh, if we have a BRT, then people if they see that this BRT will uh, will uh, spend less time. To go from A to B, people will may leave their car to use this BRT. So uh, this model shift will bring, of course, uh, saving in terms of energy, in terms of uh, of CO2 emissions. Uh, so you see the three dimensions with one project. We should try to cover the three dimensions. This is what is uh, uh, what is uh, what is important. And if I may, I would like to just add something about the on the previous question about the uh, the private uh, involvement uh, and to mention. Uh, the notion of land value capture. Because when we build a new BRT line or when we build a new metro line, the value of the land around the stations will increase. And this land, usually it is uh, owned by private uh, uh, landowners or, 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 or real estate uh, or companies, etc. So since they will benefit from that public transport project, they should contribute to its funding. Because you know we we should share, I would say, this benefit between those who are investing to build this public transport system, the public authority generally, and and the this private uh, the private uh, uh, organizations. Thank you. Some really great insights there, and we have such a lot of fantastic questions from all of you, uh, the audience listening in. Sadly, though, we are running out of time, so. We hope to be able to respond to those questions uh, separately offline. So thank you once again for some of those fantastic questions that you've posed. And I'd now like to bring to a close our panel session and invite Sung Sup Ra to deliver some closing remarks for us. Now, Sung Sup is the ADB's chief sector officer who oversees the ADB-wide technical collaboration, innovation and knowledge management for sector groups in transport, energy, urban, water, education, health and finance. Sung Sup, over to you. Uh, 
Thank you, um, Sharajan, for introduction. Good afternoon and good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Asia, Asia Devel Asian Development Bank, I'd like to begin by thank you, all of you, for actively participating in the Asia and the Pacific Transport Forum. This year's forum has explored tangible ways of accelerating sustainable and decarbonized, decarbonized transport. We hope the forum has provided some directions and practical solution to do so. We are very pleased with extremely engaging and stimulating conversation. The perspective and view helped consolidate the foundations of our joint effort toward the transformation of the sector. In this process, we always like to say that everyone has a role to play and all at levels. Concluding the Asian and the Pacific Transport Forum, I will first reiterate the strong commitments by ADB. Second, I want to remind us all that recovery from the pandemic and achievements from international agreement are not mutually exclusive. Third, and before formally closing the forum, I will once again emphasize the critical of knowledge and partnership to achieve an impact at scale. We are in the middle of a great transformation in the transport. Sorry that, <laughs> just give me one second. We are in the middle of the great transformation. Something wrong with the system. Sorry. Sung Sup, are you okay? All right, we'll we'll give Sung Sup a, a few more seconds. Um, and if not, uh, we are almost drawing to a close. So uh, We'd love to hear uh, Sung Sook Ra's closing comments uh, to us as we close uh, the ADB's Transport Forum. Of course, we know the Transport Forum takes place every two years. It's a really good chance for MDBs, stakeholders, uh, governments, and uh, even the private sector to come together to try to find solutions to all of those challenging transport issues we've been talking about, particularly when it comes to the environment and sustainability, trying to hit that decarbonization target by 2030. These are all really crucial, uh, tying in with uh, the COP26 and the Paris Accord. Um, once again, Sung Sook, just checking in with you. Are you okay now? All right, um, I'm afraid we, we won't have Sung Sook, uh, but I do thank you Sung Sook for the comments that you've made so far. Really crucial, the work that we're doing here. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I guess we can bring the ADB's Transport Forum for 2022 to a close. It's been, of course, a very productive uh, number of sessions over the past few days. And I would like to thank all our remarkable speakers, our expert panelists for some of that great insight and sharing some of the solutions and projects that are making a difference. And of course, you, the audience, for your incredible participation, some great questions uh, that you were asking our panelists. So until the next Transport Forum in uh, two years, let's aim to achieve those ambitions to have sustainable transport for everyone by 2030. Thank you all and stay safe. Thank you and bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.